Mike. Uh, did a great job introducing me. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, get started here quickly and, and give you a few, um, uh, just cover the basics of what a small farm is, and, and I'm not sure that's always very clear, uh, what is a small farm, so I wanted to give some background on that. But uh, just a couple little facts about small farms. If you, if you look at how USDA defines a farm, uh, it is any operation that produces and sells or could sell at least $1,000 worth of agricultural production. That could be, in my mind, pretty small. Uh, but what's interesting about that is that 59% uh, of our farms in the United States sell less than $10,000 worth of agricultural production. Uh, and there are over 1 million operations selling less than $5,000 worth of production. If you do a little bit of math on those numbers, I think you'll find that, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, production that is contributed from our small farms. Uh, makes them important. The uh, USDA breaks the small farms down into uh, three of the categories. I think when I think of a small farm, sometimes the first one that comes to mind for me is uh, the residential or lifestyle farm. And this is a farm that would have uh, most of the farm would be most of the income from, from the household is off farm income. But they're living out on, the, on, the, on a farm uh, for lifestyle purposes. Um, also similar to this are retirement farms where people have retired and moved out to the country but still are doing some sort of farming activity. And uh, then there are what's called limited resource farms. These are operations that are, that are uh, generating at least $100,000 worth of uh, revenue and are impoverished, which means they're below the median uh, household income level for the county. Uh, they'll have low sales. That would be uh, Again, a farming operation that was 100% is farming is the occupation still with less than $100,000 for the income. Then what's called a high sales farm. Um, farming is uh, the occupation, and they're between $100,000 and a quarter million dollars. Some of these farms that kind of fit into this category, in my mind, are, are ones uh, maybe like a small dairy that's that's milking organic milk, uh, but also maybe producing cheese as part of their their small farm operation and marketing their cheese. Um, for a regulator, we may call a small farm by the, uh, by the CAFO rule uh, designation, small, medium, and large. And a small farm by the, uh, the regulatory community would be uh, maybe something under 300 head of uh, beef cows, uh, less than 200 head of dairy cattle, less than 750 head of swine, and, and so forth. Uh, mediums, um, some, some may include medium as part of a small farm, may consider small, small and medium together kind of as small farm sizes. Uh, this would be things less than 1,000 head, um, less than 699 head of dairy cattle, less than 2,500 head of swine, and so forth. There's a big break in the regulatory community between small, medium, and large. So it's not, uh, I think it would be reasonable to call sometimes the small, mediums, the small farms. Uh, well, I think what's interesting, too, is, uh, and I got this information from uh, E-Extension, that uh, EPA estimates there are about uh, near, just under half a million animal feeding operations in the United States. If, all of these are animal feeding operations. It could add up to a lot. So I kind of gave you what the USDA and EPA think are small farms. Uh, why don't you uh, tell us, uh, the presenters, what you think is a small farm. And Jill is uh, bringing up a poll here. So if you wouldn't mind just voting real quickly, uh, check as many as you like. Uh, but what do you think is a, is a small farm? We must not have anybody from the southeast here today. Nobody's voting for the turkey. So it sounds like um, a lot of people think uh, roughly 50 head dairy is kind of um, um, a small, but we do have some people that think uh, 3,000 head feedlot is small. So no right answer, but I think as we go across the region and, and uh, as we discuss these issues, there's different kind of there's different perceptions of what is small. Small feedlot in Nebraska and Texas is probably different than Northeast. Bear that in mind as you as you listen today. Uh, well, why is manure management important on small farms? And and I put a picture here of a facility I worked with a few years ago, and it's uh, a dairy with a freestall barn and built a barn. 
it neglected to, to fully uh, design well his manure management system, and, and you can see it was, uh, it was an issue for him, which is why he came to us. But uh, many times and historically, uh, our small farm has not formally been regulated, and uh, they're also not very aware of what, what they're supposed to do. Um, but uh, with the new CAFO rules, um, they're all, and they always have been, subject to the Clean Water Act. But um, in some states, there is some flexibility with small and medium-sized operations as far as it, what, what, what level of regulation there may be in your state. Uh, most of the uh, livestock and manure are actually managed by larger farms. Um, but the sheer number of livestock, uh, small livestock operations is really daunting. And I drew up statistics from, uh, for beef operations. 71% uh, of all BF, B, U.S. beef operations, this is feedlots, cow-calf operations, are less than 1,000 head. While most of our livestock are in the large operations, they're just the sheer number of small facilities is really daunting. So I think this is a real opportunity for educators and, and consultants and regulators um, to, to address and help us address these, this underserved clientele. Um, this is uh, an example of uh, how sometimes small, small farms can add up. This is uh, some visual clues in this uh, picture here. Uh, if you look in the background, you might see some horse trailers, large buildings. This might be a horse stable or, or uh, a large uh, farm, large horse farm. They piled the manure on the creek bank. So just because we're small doesn't mean uh, we don't have, we can't have a uh, significant environmental impact. But I think uh, things are slowly changing. I hope to see it change. This is an example of a horse horse facility that's put in a manure storage on top of a hill to minimize their risk, environmental risk, and manage their manure. And sometimes when we work with small farms, we need to think outside the box. Uh, things that work for uh, large farms don't always work for small farms. But we also can do things with small farms we never think about doing for a small farm. This is a, a small farm, horse farm that has a, a manure marketing plan, as you can see. We're selling manure uh, to, to a nearby, res, to a nearby uh, sit, uh, town, small community. And sometimes, well, sometimes I think when you work with small farms, uh, it can appear very challenging at first. Uh, this is a picture of a horse facility with uh, Animals are, are knee deep in manure. Uh, doesn't look like a, a good situation. Um, there are things we can do uh, that are simple that small farms can do. This is a, um, a, a similar facility, but this producer, this person, has uh, kept kept the manure cleaned up and the lots clean. Uh, he's able. He's been able to establish vegetation in the lot area, in the production area. That's the end. Um, his environmental impact is a lot less, I think, than the previous slide. So sometimes it's just a management change. It's not always uh, something that we have to make a large physical change to the operation. Bill, I'm locked up here. I can't go net forward. Are you there, Jill? Yes, I am. Um, I'm stuck. OK, let me, I'll stop your presentation and reload it quickly. So if you have questions as we uh, go through the presentation today, feel free to, to, to put things in the chat box and, and uh, the rest of the We'll try to answer those as we go through today. I can't advance it. Jill, can you? No, it's not advancing for me either. Of technology.
Well, maybe I'll just go on and, and uh, have to miss the visuals. But uh, we have worked with, uh, in Nebraska, my group has worked a lot with small livestock producers. Some of the lessons we've learned or the challenges we've had, uh, when we work with small producers, oftentimes they are uh, very diversified. They will be uh, doing irrigation, ranching, a uh, feedlot. They may even have a town, a, a, a job in town. Um, so they've got a lot of irons in the fire. Many of them, most of them are younger, and with the younger generation, many of our producers have children in school. Um, so we work really hard to minimize the time commitment to manure, ma manure management activities, things they can do uh, very quickly and try to make it part of habit for them. Uh, generally, when we've, we've uh, been out working with producers, we find that they're not in touch with their livestock waste responsibilities and what the regulations are. I think that's a shortcoming in, in some of our parts, but uh, the, the media's focus has generally been focused on large operations and not a lot on small operations, and so they kind of assume because of that that small operations are, are not regulated or they're not an issue, and that's probably not true in many situations. But there's a lot of need for information in this sector. Uh, there's also limited resources, not just uh, for information, but also financial resources for, for, uh, for cost share assistance, for example, to compete with larger operations, far harder sometimes for small, or small operations to get equipped funding. But most of our producers, they want to do the right thing. So, um, you know, even though, but they just don't know what it is sometimes. So, we found in in uh, educational approaches, we have. Uh, it's much less successful to have a meeting just for a small farm. What we have done is tried to partner a small farm educational program as part of a larger picture, larger program. For example, we did a no-till conference and had a, had a small farm presentation as part of that conference. And we reached a lot of small farmers. There were large no-till farmers there, but a lot of them had livestock, had a small livestock operation. So you really have to think outside the box sometimes about how to reach and get educated information to, to this audience. Um, solutions that work for large livestock operations may not always be appropriate for small operations. And, and many times in the work we've done, we've had to develop systems you may have seen in earlier webcasts because uh, we can't use large pumps and things. Uh, things that work for large livestock operations don't always work for the small ones. As a result, we think that we expect there may need to be some specialized training for technical service providers or in-service training for how to um, take advantage of some of the resources and, and the mainstream things for the small livestock operation that you wouldn't necessarily have to do for a large facility, mainly because there's just so many of them. So as you go through the presentation today, I hope that you uh, you'll we'll answer two questions for you. Mainly the first one is uh, how to develop a nutrient management plan for a small farm. And I want you to look in uh, Mike's presentation. What what are the what are the differences between large and small? What do you have to do that's different? Um, and then uh, Dr. Rice's presentation at the end I think is probably the most key presentation today. But uh, there's going to be a, there's a lot of information out there that's really recent, developed specifically for the small farmer. And I'd like you to think about as you, he gives his presentation how you can use those in your own profession, whether you're. Our presentation uh, between myself and Fred Kelly, we're going to uh